you get into it, you hold it, and either you sell it or you die. And that is always the pattern. And that's the point of view, and that's how you need to be thinking about it from the beginning. The beginning, the middle, and the end. Okay. What I'm going to show you next is a very simple tool that I learned many years ago in a graduate finance course. And then we also use this in the CCIM training. I'm a CCIM as well. To organize information that's germane to this beginning, middle, end thing. Okay? And in your books, um, <coughs> let's go to it's like page 18, if you want to jump to page 18. So we've got this thing called a T account. Okay? It's a very simple two column thing, that's all it is. And there's two important headings. Time and cash flow, time and money. So the T account helps us to measure the only two things that matter, which are the time and the money. Okay? Left hand column's time, right hand column's money. When you're in the T account, you begin counting with the number zero. And people say, well, no, no, no. In America, we begin counting with the number one, not the T account. The T account, for our discussion purposes, is synonymous with the escrow, the acquisition. And what happens in the T account at the acquisition is that the investor pays out two kinds of money. We've already talked about them. The down payment plus the other cost of acquisition. That's what happens at a time period called time period zero when the investor acquires title. Okay. So one of the things that's different about the T account model compared to time value of money, cap rate, cash on cash, and all that is that the T account model is the model that allows us to understand the time horizon. In contrast to the other models, it's not a fixed moment in time. It looks at the entire holding term. Okay? I'm just going to put down one, two, three. And I'm going to call that time period one, time period two, and time period three which you would think in normal English is actually year one, year two, and year three. But in the T account, we refer to them as time periods. Okay? And one of the reasons for that is each one of these events occurs once per year. And these events are what we've known from the APOD to be pre-tax cash flow. So to give context, let me just, well, let me use Sarah's fourplex, no car, because we talked about that yesterday. At time period zero, they put down, it was like 75 grand or something like that, whatever it was. The down payment, the other cost of acquisition. Over the first three years, when they do their A pods on the subject property, each year at the end of the A pod, what did they get? They got pre-tax cash flow. This is the beginning, and this is the middle. But remember what I said, there's three legs to the stool. The beginning, the middle, and the end. Okay? And the end is represented by a new acronym. I'll introduce that now. It's called PTSP. Pre-tax sales proceeds, PTSP, okay? This is the end. Now, does this mean that they have to sell the property? Of course not. But it does mean that to use the model and understand the overall rate of return, that there needs to be an establishment 
of if they sold the property, paid off the debt, and just left at the escrow with the cash as if they were a seller, what would that number be? Because this model looks at the entire holding term. Right? Now here's a little thing about this model that's super important. You must always add your cash flows to your sales proceeds in the final year of ownership. Because if you don't, this would get carried down and create a fictitious, non-existent fourth period. It would water down your overall rate of return. It would be incorrect. So you have to always add these two together in your last time period. Another way to think about this model, again, point of view is everything. Cash out cash flow, cash in. It's another way to think about it. And if you think about it, you realize that's really what this whole thing is about. And another little word picture that I'm going to introduce now is th this is what brokers do. Okay, So brokers help clients go from cash to asset and from asset to cash. That's a broker's mission. Take this money that I have and put me in title to a fixed building. Or take me out of this title and give me my money. That's the charge of the broker, you see? The owner and the property manager are involved here during the asset phase. And if you are a value add investor, like a flipper or a rehabber or just a buy and hold or whatever you are, this is where value is created or not. It's where it's created. See, it's recognized when you go from asset to cash, but it's created here. This is a very different relationship that the investor has with the property than the broker. Very different. Owner is much more aligned with the property manager. That's the marriage. The broker comes in for the one night stand. He says, I'll take care of all your problems, just pay me. And they're done. Just a different relationship. To me, the importance of this model is a couple things, okay? First of all, this model forces us to clarify thinking about what is this thing really going to do. Forces us to go through in subsequent years and look at an APOD. Or the counterpart to APOD in course two is called the cash flow worksheet because it introduces the taxation elements. But forces us to go through. What's going to happen to rents? What's going to happen to vacancies? What's going to happen to expenses? Okay. Forces us, in, if we're in the beginning at time period zero, to make a reasonable assumption about appreciation, which would lead us to this, PTSP. You know, I don't know if you guys know this or not. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, maybe you know it a little bit. I know it a lot because I've been doing what I've been doing for so long. <clears throat> if you look at metropolitan coastal communities, up and down the west coast, up and down the, right co the east coast, you see the same phenomenon from Seattle to LA and from Manhattan to Miami. And this is what it is in the metropolitan markets. Smaller investment properties barely cash flow. Maybe a little, might be a little negative, but not much. Everybody is making the same bet. What's the bet? Appreciation, okay? This is the only model that can give you the right answer 
If you're just poking along, two, three, five, ten years, not really cranking in on cash flow, but really hoping for that appreciation, this is the only way you know what it really means. It's a super powerful tool. To me, as a broker, far more complete than cap rate. Far more important than cap rate. That's funny. So I used to work with this other broker when I lived in Sun Valley. And she and I went through CCM training together. She's also an SIOR. So we both have all the pedigrees and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we had big disagreement about this thing. And the reason was because she was purporting that her clients were just inflating the pre-tax sales proceeds based on the appreciation. Therefore, it was all out of whack. Well, okay, then just don't do that. Makes sense to me. But I think her bigger problem was she's so deeply embedded and drinking the Kool-Aid of cap rate that it's hard for her to make the shift. We both know what it is, but it's hard for the and you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. I don't work with her anymore. But my point is, even my academic contemporaries in practice have kind of a hard time with this. I invite you to open your mind to it. It's a really strong tool. Okay? All right. The next thing that I want to say about this tool is that if you use it enough, if you think about it enough, if you invite it into your world enough, what you begin to see is it's property and gender neutral. It doesn't care. Okay? And here's what I'm saying. You're running around, you want to invest in something, okay? Or you're working with a client. And the truth is, you don't really know what you want to buy. You just know that they want a good deal, okay? So you go look at the, the little office building. You look at the, the house. You look at a piece of land. And you're trying to understand, well, which one should I do? When you get to the end of all this, and you enter the cash flows into your HP 10B2, and you press a button called IRR, you get one answer. It's a percent value. And what it represents is the overall rate of return from beginning to middle to end. Now, we haven't talked much about land in here. So let me just use this opportunity to illustrate visually what the investor is signing up for when the investor goes with land. I'll use a three-year time horizon. Negative, 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 plus prey <laughs> right there. That's what the land person is signing up for. I'd also tell you this, in my personal experience in my career, understanding land use, understanding rezones and things like that, I've made more money doing that than almost anything else I've done in my life. I'm not going to get all that right now, but I'm just saying don't be afraid of land if you understand how to do certain things. It can give you an extraordinary payoff, but you have to have enough cash to float it until you get to the end. See, that's the rub with land usually. Okay. The beginning, the middle, and the end. It's a point of view. It's a way to be thinking about these things. And brokers oftentimes neglect the middle part. It's a really important piece. Because brokers get paid at the beginning and the end, not in the middle. 